Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Laura Haywood. Today's guest is the recipient of a Jonathan Larson grant, a Fred Ebb Award, and many other professional accolades. She's appeared in groundbreaking theater productions, including Hadestown and Natasha Pierre in The Great Comet of 1812. She writes songs for Julie's Green Room and Sesame Street, and her musical adaptations of Shakespeare's Twelfth Night and As You Like It were commissioned by the Public Theater. Shayna Taub is working on a new musical about Alice Paul and the women's suffrage movement, and her new album, Die Happy, is out this week. We have so much to talk about. Please welcome Shayna Taub. Thank you so much. Thanks, Laura. I have wanted to interview you for a long time, oh, awesome. and this feels like your moment. In fact, I believe the New York Times said this is the year of Shayna Taub. That's very kind. Uh, you're doing so much. Doing a lot, yeah. Very How cool. do you manage it all? I have a chart. Mm -hmm. that... What does it look like? <laughs> well, <laughs> it's it's week by week, and like, <laughs> yeah, I'll just, I'll just say it's like the horizontal lines are by week and then the vertical columns are by project and I just kind of map it out week to week and make sure it all gets done. How did it happen that the album and all the other projects you're working on right now, it seems like they're all hitting simultaneously. Was that by design? Well, with the album, I knew, I, you know, I spent all of last year, all of 2017, playing once a month at Joe's Pub, where mm -hmm. I still play right. regularly. But the goal over last year's concert was to write this album. And by the end of the year, to have the songs ready, to know that I would go into the studio in January to record them. Mm -hmm. and for me right now, I'm working on writing with, with theater. Then I knew I wanted to kind of have this album done and and recorded before I kicked off all that writing and then I since it's an independent release I plan to kind of have it before the summer and share it with people yeah. it's so excellent and every single song has a very distinct feel um I listen to it uh, just a ton like I haven't been able to stop listening to it oh, since thanks. it came out on May 1st and um and it it's one of it reminds me of how <laughs> make me sound so old like how we used to listen to music where you'd listen to the album in order and yeah. it has this kind of ebb and flow to it oh I'm so glad yeah because um, it's so fun to design the track order and try and think about the listener of giving them a journey even though you know the songs are all about all kinds of different things but to hopefully give it an arc so I'm glad to hear that yeah, yeah. um the title track is the first one mm -hmm. tell us about die happy yeah so yeah if it, it's it's funny because the song was initially called die happy and then I retitled it if I die before you so I could call oh, the album got it Die happy but um yeah, I wrote that song. I initially wrote it, They I did this show called Old Hats mm. at the Signature Theater with the Bill Irwin, David Shiner. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's um, so good. And they wanted a song to be done kind of at the intermission, just to kind of like in between acts to kind of pump people up. And what I love so much about the, the clowns is that they really mix dark and light and mm -hmm. that they take really serious subjects and kind of deliver them in an irreverent way. So I was like, all right, why don't we do a doo-wop song about death? And that was sort of the <laughs> little prompt I gave myself to, to write that song. And so... I always think of the clowns fondly when I perform it. Is that yeah. song also on the songs from Old Hats? No, no, because it was sort of like an intermission song. Uh -huh. I always it was sort of this little interstitial song for Old Hats, and then I kind of fully fleshed out the arrangement for my own concert work and hadn't yet recorded it, so it just felt sort of right to build this album around that track because so much of this album, or right, what I was going for, is kind of combining both serious and intense subjects and also really light subjects and kind of weaving those together. So Die Happy felt like the right kickoff point. You have such a, a talent for that. Um, you have other songs on this album that are about love and heartbreak and you have other songs on this album that are about um, your family and then you have uh, songs that are really, really activist anthems. Mm -hmm. uh, and they, like I said, they flow together so beautifully. Um, there's also something even though this is not an, a theater album, there is something sort of theatrical slash vaudevillian about you and your sound. And I think the through line of all of the work that I've ever experienced of yours is that it, it comes down to great storytelling. Do you mm -hmm. consider yourself a storyteller? And that's what I love in songs. And for me, you know, to what I love about my favorite Frank Lesser songs is also what I love about my favorite Ben Folds or Joni Mitchell songs is, yeah, that quality of telling a story and mm -hmm. taking the artist or the listener on a journey. Um, so yeah, yeah, I mean, I, uh, that's what I strive to do. So you've got this Joe's Pub residency that's continuing, mm -hmm. um, not far from here. Yeah. Uh, what kind of music can we, or what, what kind of songs can we expect to hear when we go see you at Joe's Pub? Is it songs from the album? Is it a mix of all of your work? It's really songs from the record, yeah, mm -hmm. the, and especially this spring. It's been fun to kind of play all those songs live and to feature different artists and guests and friends. Like at this, we're playing an album release show on May 15th that I love, I love to work with large groups of singers, so it'll be kind of a big choir. Who's coming in that we might know coming oh, on to be part of the show? 
Yeah, totally. Well, um, Kate Ferber, who's an amazing songwriter and performer who I co-wrote the song she persisted with, mm. um, will be performing with me. And the rapper who appears on the album, Sheree Davis, who I love, will be there. Uh, yeah, so those are a few. That's great. Um, let's talk about these Shakespearean adaptations that you've done. Yeah. Um, Twelfth Night was quite an experience, like no other version of that play I've ever seen before. Yeah. Um, the design was totally new and different and, and vibrant and bold, and so was the music. Talk about um, taking this hundred year, several hundred year old text and adapting it to something that felt and sounded so modern. Yeah, well, it's a very fun challenge to, that, that the Public Works musical uh, gives you. And so for me, it was take, yeah, this three-hour play from hundreds of years ago and adapt one of the greatest plays of all time <laughs> and adapt into a 90-minute musical that works for 200 people on the Delacorte stage. Go. <laughs> and so for me, it was just a process of, of stripping away and finding the essence of the play and seeing how I could illuminate that through song moments. And then what's fun musically, as composing-wise, is that I really got to go all over the map in terms of style and genre and influence because the community that I'm writing the show for, which is this community of hundreds of New Yorkers that are with these partner organizations that the public theater collaborates with to make these productions are from so many different cultural backgrounds. So mm -hmm. I thought it'd be really fun for the show that was made for them uh, to reflect that in the music, to for, on, you know have one song that's Motown, have one song that's New Orleans flavor, one that's more of a Broadway show tune, one that's South African uh, rhythmically influenced, you know, like and really have that license as a composer to go all over the map, whereas in other projects, I feel like I have to kind of hone in to kind of have a slightly more like cohesive musical take, whereas mm -hmm. Public Works, it feels fun to really, anything goes, whatever the song, whatever that song moment demands, I can have any style at my fingertips, so that's really I fun. heard you say Orlando had to be Backstreet Boys. Oh, that's so funny. Yeah, well, that with <laughs> As You Like It, because Orlando right. writes, these, writes these love notes to Rosalind, and the idea is like, they're pretty corny love notes, but you don't want to hate him. It's not creepy. It's not slimy. It's sort of like cringe or like, <laughs> he's so, so well intentioned. Right. So what's a genre that like is corny, but is also kind of a guilty pleasure that you're like, e -e -e. when I was like, boy, man. you know, like you love to listen to that, but you wouldn't necessarily want your boyfriend to like have a flash mob and do in sync for you. I mean, maybe you would <laughs> teach their own, honestly. I feel like you would. Like well, knowing, I, knowing <laughs> I know one of my favorite facts about you is that you're doing this really like progressive, beautiful, deep, um, and activist-driven music, but I know you grew up on boy bands, Spice Girls, Ooh, yeah. and that pop music was a huge influence on how you grew as an artist. Totally. And I love that about you. When I heard, I remember hearing everybody groove to the music on the radio, that Backstreet Boys song, uh -huh. and it was, it's like one of the seminal moments of my life. Like when I first <laughs> heard that, I was, and at first I remember it was in the car, and I was like, who are these women? I thought they were women, <laughs> like just their vocals were so, and I was like... So, yeah, and that. then your other favorite artists I know are like um, Stevie Wonder and Billy Joel and totally um, Joni Mitchell. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and you you ride this line where I can hear the influences of both types of music. The sort of more I think of them as like the teenage music and the grown up music, <laughs> um, which actually yeah. brings us to another song on the album that I love from this, which is. Uh, uh, which is Where Are the Grown Ups. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that song. Totally. So Where Are the Grown Ups, I wrote like a month or so after the inauguration mm -hmm. <laughs> last year. And I was, I, I remember, but in the, I first got the inspiration from it in the wake of the election. I was talking to some of my friends that have young kids. And I, I remember just sending a round of texts around to different parent, friends who are parents and being like, I'm so glad you're raising kids right now. Like, it just gives me hope that like you're, someone like you is going to bring the next generation. Mm -hmm. And it was inspired by two things I don't even know if I've really told them that they inspired this, but I should. I'll tell them now. Yeah. But one of them said, is she, he had a three-year-old daughter, my friend Clinton, and he was like, I just don't know how to tell Karina that the biggest bully won the biggest prize. You know, like, how do you explain that to your kid? And then my other friend, Celia, usually the actress, Celia Keenan-Bolger, mm -hmm. she was like, she, it's, I should really credit her with the song because she was like, I just keep looking around wondering where the grown-ups are, and then I'm like, oh, I'm the grown-up. And I was like, oh, right. So it was just kind of hearing from different, I don't have kids myself yet, but like, hearing from different parents kind of how they were explaining what was going on to their children inspired this mm -hmm. one. Yeah. You've also written about your own parents um, mm -hmm. in some autobiographical songs. Yeah. That's got to be really difficult. Um, how do they feel about the fact that you're talking about um, their relationship so openly? It's a good question. We'd have to ask them. But <laughs> I had, but for me, you know, I'm really inspired by especially friends of mine who you know, I think of my friend Benjamin Schroyer, who's an amazing songwriter oh. who does this show called The Lion, and he really inspired me with some of these songs to really dig deeper in a personal way, and I think what I've learned is when certain songs, the impulse for certain songs come out that are really personal, 
it feels, my life would be so much more convenient if I didn't write them. I remember when I was writing the song, Your Old Guitar, I was in rehearsals for As You Like It. I had no time to do anything. I had deadlines for other things, but I just kept finding myself working on this song. And I think certain, it's for me been, you know, a process of opening that channel that mm -hmm. even when a song feels scary to write, that usually means that you should probably write it. Lean in. <laughs> you it's know funny I mean? that you mentioned Ben Scheuer because, and then that song, Your Old Guitar, because I yeah. thought of him when I heard that song, because he talks in The Lion about this old guitar he has. He has this song, Cookie Tin Banjo. He's one of my dear friends, and we joke about that they're sort of like the evil twin song of each other. Yeah. That they're both like a similar There's similar an, a lost guitar but, out there. Totally. In both but songs. But I've been, yeah, inspired by, by him, my friend Abigail Bengson, too, of just like how you take your own, or like how um, uh, Princess Leia said, you know, well, not Princess Leia, the actor, but um, Carrie. Carrie Fisher. Th thank yeah. you. Sorry, I got nervous. I was like, all I could think was Princess Leia. Yeah. But, um, Carrie Fisher said, take your broken heart and turn it into art. So uh -huh. I think about that. Or there's also this Anne, Anne Lamont quote that's like, make art as though your family, where this sounds dark, but I it spoke to me of like, make art as though your family weren't around. Or like, yeah. you have to kind of like make the art that speaks to you or that's coming from your heart without necessarily worrying about them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, there's, it also reminds me of Susan Blackwell's lyric in the, in the song Die Vampire Die from Title Show, uh -huh. where she's like, if you listen to all the vampires, you'll end up with two perfect lines that your mima would be so proud of. Totally, <laughs> you <know>? totally, totally. <laughs> like, you just got to put those voices. Um, uh, mm -hmm. One of the first songs of yours that ever made me cry from one of your earlier albums was called We Don't Live Here Anymore, We Don't Live uh -huh. There Anymore. More. Yeah, yeah. And um, the song on this album, uh, Family Plan, yeah. felt sort of like a sequel to that. It, they, I do feel like those are related. It's funny you say that because for a while, oftentimes on concert, I'll play those two back to back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Family Plan for me, it's about, you know, those mundane moments in life that are sort of like an errand or a thing on a to-do list that all of a sudden you're confronted with the task of dealing with it and it hits you in a deep, unexpected way. Mm -hmm. How it makes me think of like Kander and Ebb's song, A Quiet Thing. But what? like, I don't know that song. It's like, <laughs> I was just thinking, what, what's it's like, it from? It's like the lyric... I actually don't know what it's from. Oh. Oh. Sorry to put you on but the think, spot. No, no, but the lyric is like, when it all comes true, just the way you planned, it's funny, but the bells don't ring. It's a quiet thing. Mm. Or this, uh, this idea that like when your dreams really come true, it's a more quiet moment and not some big moment. I think sometimes that can happen with sadness as well, or these little moments that take you off guard that you weren't expecting. So for me, it was like, you know, moving out of a childhood house or like looking at an old photograph or switching your phone plan, <laughs> you know, like little moments that all of a sudden you're like, wow, this actually has a deeper impact. That song also demonstrates your beautiful use of wordplay and how the term family plan can mean so many different things. Like there's the family plan and then there's, there's your family plan. Mm -hmm. And each verse takes a slightly different look at that, um, that turn of phrase. Yeah, and I yeah. love that about you as a songwriter in general. Oh, thank you. Um, I also think it's hilarious and wonderful that you never imagined you were gonna be a songwriter, that you grew up as a singer and a dancer. Um, this is a fun fact. I hope everybody goes and finds the documentary stage door because you get to see baby Shayna singing at the piano and dancing her little heart out um, as the, this musical theater actress. Um, I would say in training, but like you have more talent than like <laughs> you were trained at that point. Um, yeah. and, and then it was Liz Suedos who inspired you to start writing your own work. Is that right? Totally. Yeah, I grew up performing and, and always being a theater lover and I came to school to study performing. And then I sort of, I knew, I feel like there was always like the itch inside that I knew I wanted to create work, but I couldn't, I couldn't quite get there yet. I mm -hmm. just didn't, I couldn't connect those dots. And then one of my dear friends, Sam Pinkleton, one night in our dorm was like, you should come to Liz Suedos' class with me. And like, it's called performance adaptation, creating original work. And I was uh -huh. like, what does that mean? He's like, it means anything you want. <laughs> and so I went to that class with him. And, and now he's this Tony-nominated choreographer. And, I know, he's uh, amazing. And it I was know. such a beautiful full circle moment when he directed Runaways and sit in the we all yeah. kind of, there's, so, there's this group of us that, and it extends even beyond my you know, social circle. It's just hundreds and hundreds of artists in the city whose lives were changed by Liz. It's amazing to kind of be a part of that legacy. Let's talk about uh, your upcoming musical based on the women's suffrage, mo women's suffrage movement. Yeah. Does it have a name yet? Uh, not yet. I'm still figuring it out. Okay. But yeah, but suffrage, it's funny because people often say, you know, the suffragettes. Mm -hmm. And what I've learned in my research and with this is that suffragette, it's no surprise that that's the word that has sort of stood the test of a century because that actually at the time in the 1910s, when the final stretch of this movement, that was sort of the derogatory diminu diminutive term for the activists. It was like, oh, you suffragettes. Oh, it's so cute that you think you can make a difference. That's huh. adorable, suffragette, to add the like feminine ending. Yeah. Was there ever such a thing called a suffrager? 
Well, that's, you know, suffragers shows up every once in a while in like weird articles like from the time. So it's not, you're not totally about, but what they call themselves and what I call them is suffragist. Mm. So like in the histories and when you see them actually writing about themselves as suffragist and kind of scholarly, but suffragette is what often showed up like in the papers or in the like 1910s parlor songs. Like, look how adorable they are, thinking they can make a difference. Exactly, exactly. Mm-hmm. It was sort of like a bit of a cut down. Well, I, I, everything I have heard from people who have gone to readings and presentations of this musical is that it is, it, it's incredible. Like, oh, I've heard it compared to Hamilton as like 10 years from now when people are talking about this new wave of historical musicals with current modern music, that like th- th- your suffragist musical is going to be the second one mentioned after Hamilton. Oh, thank you. That's very nice. I mean, to me, it's amazing with musicals, you know, so a new generation of kids is growing up on Hamilton and learning uh, learning about the Revolutionary War and the founding of this country through that. And for me, is when I was growing up, I was listening to Ragtime, and I know an mm-hmm. important amount about 1906 because of that musical. And to me, since this history feels like this chap, this suffragist history is missing from the narrative we get taught in school, or at least I was, as like a young American girl, like hungry for my own story, mm. I didn't find this until my 20s. So like to me, the reason I think specifically I want to make it a musical is because musicals are these things that we all like try on time and time again. Everyone does Music Man or Fiddler in middle school, high school. These You come together as a community and tell these stories year after year. Mm-hmm. So for me, one of my main goals to write it is hopefully, the, you know, a new generation of girls will grow up playing Alice Paul and Lucy Burns and learn about it through musicals the way I learned about history through musicals. Yeah, awesome. Oh, man, I could just sit and talk to you for hours. We'll do it. We'll um, just have to go get a drink after this. <laughs> That sounds good. Uh, we have time to take a couple of questions from the audience, and then we're going to take a tiny little break, and you're going to actually perform a couple of songs for yeah. us. Who has a question? Hello. You were, you were just speaking about um, creating music that stays true to yourself. Mm-hmm. Has it ever been difficult to create music that's authentic to who you are and not, you know, be a, a regular musician that creates pop music? Well, yeah, I mean, to me, with writing, I write a lot of songs that I throw away. So I feel like I've written in order to, like, every song that I put on this record that feels like have at least gotten to a place that feels authentic to me, I've probably thrown away four or five other songs. So like, yes, I feel like I've spent a lot of time writing songs that it's me trying to sound like something else or trying to write the kind of lyric that I think will people will find funny or move, you know, like trying to tr- put on a different voice. So yeah, it's something I, I struggle with and continue to. But for me, what I found is the answer is just to write more and more and more because I learn, you know, out of every 10 songs I write, I might keep one and then that's a good yield for me. <laughs> yeah. Do you ever have to deal with people um, you. getting your autobiographical songs and your storytelling fictionalized songs confused and thinking something is your personal history when it's not? Maybe, but I'm just not as concerned with that. I don't know. I'm like, whatever you take from it, whatever moves you, you know. Yeah. Cool. Um, one more question. Hi. Um, do you find it difficult being able to perform on stage as opposed to being able to, like... Uh, sing your own music? Or you mean like performance shows written by other people? Or yeah. Per- yeah, I mean, I really do love both. To, to me, it's, they're, they, they bring out, I, they excite me in different ways, but I really, I really do love both. Yeah, for instance, being in the shows you were mentioning, Hades Town and The Great Comet, it was so satisfying to perform in those shows because those writers, Dave Malloy and A.S. Mitchell, I admire so much. So to like be inside of their work eight times a week and get to really hear it hundreds of times and learn from it is something I really like. I got to see you perform in Ragtime at Ellis Island, and that, that was must such have just a cool been a pivotal, a pivotal moment for you. That was pretty amazing, because I really, I was a Ragtime obsessive, and so uh-huh. to kind of be a part of that and to meet some of the original cast and to be a, that, yeah, that was an amazing night. Well, everybody order uh, Shana Taub, Die Happy online. Um, it's a digital only right now, um, and we're going to actually get to hear a couple of tracks from the album. So we're just going to take a quick break to set up the stage for that. Shana, you're amazing. I'm so glad that you're here. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks. 